Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. So today is Sunday, in case you were wondering. It is the first day of the week, and uh, it feels like spring is here, right? Weather's good, and uh, by the time you uh, leave from this place, we're probably going to have like 80-degree weather. I mean, I think that's that's amazing. It's like beach weather, which which is a good thing. But hey, I am so glad that today you have recognized the importance of being in God's house. Making sure that we give God the first fruits of our week. You know, when God created the heavens and the earth, he created it all in, in seven days according to the word of the Lord. Well, he created it in six, but on, on the seventh, he rested. And so when we think about the the greatness of our God just by looking at the sky alone knowing that we're not an accident we were created by an almighty God that so loved the world and he's given us his written word which we know today as the Bible and in the Old Testament of the Bible there, there is a special book that has a lot of a lot of writings in it a lot of chapters and that's the book of Psalm filled with poems and, and music and, and prayers. But, but the last chapter, which is Psalm 150, it ends with an encouragement for those that worship God to give God their very best. I mean, if you really look at that chapter, that's what it's saying. It's saying when you worship God, worship him with your all. Worship with symbols. That's right. Symbols. Worship him with dancing. Worship him with gladness in your heart. When everything, is, when everything is said and done, when we acknowledge who God is, it should bring us tremendous joy. Because God could have done this so different. But yet God said, I love people, and I want people to know me, and I want people to experience my love, and I want people to worship me. Because can I tell you something? When we worship God in spirit and in truth, There's something to be said that God is pleased about that, and we get encouraged and lifted because we're worshiping the one true God. Amen? So with that said, why don't you stand with me this morning? And with with holy hands, holy hands, because, because of Jesus, we are holy. Lift up those hands before the Lord. God, we thank you for this moment. We thank you, God, for the opportunity you've given us to be in this place today. We thank you, God, for the moments of celebration and joyfulness that will be coming out of our hearts, out of our, out of our lips today, God. So, Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord, that we could worship you, that we could sing to you, that we could acknowledge you, God. And we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. And the people of God said, and the people of God said, let's worship our King. Hallelujah. I'll praise in the valley, praise on the mountain. I'll praise when I'm sure, praise when I'm doubting. I'll praise when outnumbered, praise when surrounded. Cause praise is the water, my enemy drowning. As long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason to praise the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. I'll praise when I feel it, and I praise when I don't. I'll praise because I know. You're still in control. See, my praise is a weapon. It's more than a sound. Oh, my praise is a shout that brings Jericho down. As long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason to praise the Lord. Oh, my soul. 
God, we worship you, Lord. We give you honor and praise. Yes, Lord, you deserve all of our praise. Jesus, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. See the tomb where he laid. See the stone rolled away. He is risen, he is risen, he's alive. See his hands, see his feet, touch his scars and believe. He is risen, he is risen, he's alive. And oh, he's alive. G. 
Lord, we worship you this morning as we're singing this next song, The Blessing. Not only receive this blessing over your life, over your family, over generations to come, over from your family, the legacy you're going to leave behind, but also claim it over your life right now. Right now, just speak it, sing it out, believe it, declare it in Jesus' name. shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. shine upon you, be gracious to you. 
His favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May His favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May His favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May His favor be upon you and a thousand and your family Oh, Jesus, do it now. May his presence go before you and behind you and beside you, all around you and within you. He is with you. He is with you in the morning, in the evening, in your coming, in your going, in your weeping and rejoicing. He is for you. 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 And your family and your children and their children and their children. May his presence go before you and behind you and beside you, all around you and within you. He is with you, he is with you in the morning, in the evening, in your coming, in your going, in your weeping. And rejoicing, he is for you, 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 he is for you.
finds a way to turn your impossibilities to something possible. 
I want you to know that. I want you to always remember that. God will turn what seems impossible to you to something possible. Think about it. There was a sea that prevented the people of God to go to the other side as the Egyptians were coming after them. And yet God parted the sea and created a highway for them to walk through. Think about that. God took dry bones and created an army out of that. God turned around and transformed water into wine so that a family won't be embarrassed during their wedding celebration. Ladies and gentlemen, God cares. God cares about your situation. He cares about your challenges. He hasn't leaving you and he hasn't forsaken you. How many of you believe that this morning with me? How many can give God praise for that truth this morning? Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. And with that same spirit and that same move of God that is happening in our hearts, I want us to take a brief moment today. And we as the children of God, as the church of Jesus Christ, we are encouraged, if not strongly commanded, to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And Lord, we want to come together and pray. As you know, attacks came upon Israel. And by the grace of God, because it is only by the grace of God, it seemed like none of these missiles attacked, uh, were able to touch land in Jerusalem. Look, there's warfare happening everywhere. Israel, Ukraine, Haiti, many other parts of the world. There's also spiritual warfare happening in our lives and in the lives of so many people. But again, we believe that no weapon formed against God's people will ever prosper. So, Lord, we come together as one today. And we thank you, Lord, for the moment of celebration and jubilee, this moment of worship, God, in which it will continue on throughout this entire service. But, Lord, I believe, Father, that I will do this church a disservice if we don't come together today as your people to pray over the peace of Jerusalem. My Lord and my God, we know, Father, that there's a lot of things happening in the Middle East, Lord. Tensions, Father God. And, and what happens with war is that innocent people are the ones receiving the, 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 the ultimate uh, sacrifice, right? And, and Lord, we, we, we pray, God. We pray for peace. We, we want peace in Israel, Lord. We want, Father, for this to cease, oh God. We, we pray above all else, Lord. That what the enemy is intending for evil, God, we know that you know how to turn that around for good. And we pray that the gospel of Jesus Christ will flourish in the Middle East, oh God. I pray, God, that our Jewish friends, Father, that have not accepted the fact that you, Jesus, are the true Messiah, help them see, Father, even through what's happening right now, help them to see that Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And that you care about our eternity above all else. And that, and that the Messiah that they have been promised, that Messiah is you, Jesus, and you will come back. You will come back. Your covenant for Israel still, still is true today. And God, as your children, God, that because, again, because, Lord, of the faith of the Jewish people and the one true God. That, that, that teaching, God, has been allowed for us, Father, the Gentiles, to hear and receive the gospel. And now, Lord, we are part of the divine plan. And God, I, I just ask you, Lord, I ask for peace. I ask that you will help the hurting. I, I pray, God, that this war comes to an end, and Lord, and that the gospel will flourish. I understand, Lord, that, that there's more to this than what I, I, my mind could comprehend. But, Lord, I do know this. You have called us to pray. And I pray for Israel. I pray for Haiti as well. I pray for Ukraine. I pray for Russia. I pray for the nations of the world, God. Taiwan that just experienced, Father, I believe an earthquake not too long ago, Father God. Again, these things happen all over the world. 
God, I pray peace. I pray the gospel to flourish. And God, the challenges that we're personally facing, help us through them, oh God. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. Give us courage and wisdom, Lord, to rise above, Father, what comes our way. Helping us understand, again, that you're for us and not against us. We give you glory and honor and praise. And the people of God said? And the people of God said? To God be the glory. Amen? Take this moment and welcome. Welcome all our friends. Welcome all our family to the house of the Lord this morning. Make sure you greet somebody that you never greeted before. Walk around this auditorium. Go ahead. Take your time. Greet, 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 greet. Welcome, everyone. Good morning and welcome to Life Point Church where we belong, believe, become, and bring. We're so happy that you decided to join us this morning and this Sunday. And welcome to the Familia. If this is your first time here at LPC, we just want to recognize you and love to meet you after service in the foyer, face-to-face, -face, where you can go out and fill out a connection card. And that connection card is just to know a little bit more about you so you can know a little bit more about LifePoint. And then we also have different ways to go ahead and get connected. So if you're viewing us online, you can also go ahead and use our QR code as well as our phone number or our aglpc.org website. So once again, we just want to get connected with you, any type of platform. Um, but if you are in person, I'd love to see you face-to-face -face after service. Going on to our LPC top threes. Our first one being bingo night next Friday. Say next Friday. Yes, bingo. I had a lot of fun last time. Yes. It is this Friday probably at 7 p.m. That one's at 6. See, you caught that. See, that's why the flyers are important, you know? But yes, it's going to, and our, our EGLPC.org website always has, like, the correct dates and times. We're human. We make mistakes, right? But once again, um, it is going to be at 7 p.m. next Friday. I went last time, and it was a real blessing to see other people from our other congregation as well and just get to mingle and make new friends. So if you're not busy, next Friday at 7 p.m. is a big go night. It's going to be a lot of fun. And then moving on to our next 
LPC Top 3 is our mobile market Friday um, the 26th at 4 p.m. Once again, the mobile market is a big deal. Like I said all the time, last time the parking lot was filled, and they could always use extra hands. So once again, it's going to be at the at uh, April 26th, the mobile market. And then our LPC Top 3, number 3 is Come to the Table, which is um, Saturday the 27th at 5.30 p.m. I always like to say if you can donate your a dish, you can donate your time, or vice versa. They could always appreciate the extra hands or dishes to serve the community. And if you know anybody who could really benefit from a meal with others, once again, that's a great ministry to go ahead and plug them into. And then our special one is going to be about our young adults um, link up, which Mr. Orlando is going to talk about. Good morning, guys. So on Friday, April 26th, the last Friday of the month, our young adults is going to be teaming up with Faith Church Highlands Young Adults. And we're going to just have a, a night of fellowship, devotion, games. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. Me and my brother-in-law are actually planning it. Um, it's going to be great. If you guys haven't joined us for our young adults gathering ever, this would be a great first time to come and meet, see what we're all about, connect with other people that are in the same age group as us and going through the same situations that we're going through as well. If you want any more information on it, there will be a flyer posted on our website and on Facebook this week. Um, but if you guys have any, any more questions, feel free to reach out to me or my wife, and we'll be more than glad to help out. And I hope to see you guys all there. Thank you. And that is it for our LPC Top 3s. Once again, if you're looking for a way to get plugged in, you can always talk to me or one of our Connection Team members, and we'd love to go ahead and get you plugged in somewhere here at the Familia. God bless you. All right. Thank you, Emily. Okay. Well, as our ushers get ready to receive our tithes and offering, but, but don't come up yet, worship team, because I got, I got some good news to share with the congregation. So this week... Um, I received a phone call uh, from a generous donor that wants to uh, give the church money towards helping reduce the debt relief campaign that we've been working on for the last year. Uh, but before I kind of share a little bit more about that, let me give you a graph as to how and where our debt is currently in. So we could show that. Back in May of 2023, I asked the church to consider praying to give towards the principal of our loan. Our loan back then was 61463 As of current date, because of your generosity and your giving towards this debt reduction campaign, we are currently at 23855 I mean, that, that is amazing. The goal behind when we started this campaign was that we wanted to get out of debt by the end of June, mid-July. So this is already April, right? And we are at 238. May, we got April, May, and June. So we got three months to make what I believe the Lord has laid in my heart to do, pay off this entire debt. With that said, this week I received a phone call from a donor that said, Pastor, I would love to donate $12,000 towards the debt reduction. <laughs> However, the donor has asked to double the impact, the donor has requested that their donation be used as a dollar for dollar match. So we need your help to make this happen. Your contribution of $50 in May and another 50 in June can help us reach our 23855 target by mid-July. With the support of at least 100 individuals like you, we can pay off this debt. And so if we got 12000 and we owe about 24000 right, give or take, that means we got what? 12000 left. And if 100 people will commit to say, hey, I could turn around and give 50 in April, 50 in May, or 50 in May and 50 in June, we can get out of debt. Now, look, what I really want you to do above all else for those that are in person, those that are viewing us, is that I want you to bring this to the Lord in prayer because I know that many of you have already given to this. I know that. I mean, God has already touched your heart and you have already given to this. 
and, uh, and, and you're probably saying, well, I already gave. Do I need to give again? Well, maybe God is challenging you and encouraging you to do that. And we say, well, pastor, I, I don't have $50. Or I don't have $100 to give between now and then. Then give whatever the Lord lays in your heart to give. Okay? I, I understand that this is, this is a God thing. You know, some of, some of you may be compelled, led by the Lord, to give more than 100. I mean, so all, all this to say is, this is something that I know that with your help and the leading of the Holy Spirit, obviously, upon your heart, we will be able to completely be out of debt. Let me, let me throw this at you a little bit, if I don't mind. Since I became the lead pastor 11 years ago, we, we, our church was in debt of at least $300,000. Okay, here we are 11 years later and we're $23,000 away or really $12,000 away to be completely out of debt. And how many can give God praise for that? Amen. I mean, and so I, I, I want the church to, to know where we're at in regards to our, our debt relief campaign. Both of our campuses are coming together to, to make this happen. And, and I thank God. Look, I, I, I will say this. This week I was praying to the Lord and I was like, God, you told me last year to bring this before the church. And when I met with my elders about what the Lord laid in my heart, my elders will tell you, my leadership will tell you. I even had hesitancy. I said, God put this in my heart, but I don't know. I don't know. And I kept on saying that. And shame on me. Shame on me. Because at the end of the day, God, God owns it all. <laughs> God is the one in charge. And here we are a few months away. And I get this call. And God says, hey, I'm going to take care of this. And so will you consider that? That's all I'm asking you to do. Consider that. Pray through it. Now, again, this is above your tithes and offerings, okay? I don't want you to take money out of missions and money out of tithe to help do this. Don't, don't do that. Because then what you're doing is giving Paul to pay Peter and all that. And can I tell you, there's no faith in that, okay? There, no, we, we give sacrificially. And we're going to say, okay, God, this, these are my tithes. This is what I give to missions. And Lord, you know what? This is an addition to where we're at. So just, again, consider it, pray through it. And, and I look forward within the next few weeks to share with you what God has done through you to help us pay off this debt. Amen. To God be the glory. Amen. All right, worship team, come and join me. And, and as our ushers come here at our church, we believe that giving is an act of worship. We understand that everything that we have and everything that we enjoy belongs to God. And God said, bring to the storehouse. Bring to the storehouse that that belongs to me. So with that said, stand at your feet as we worshipfully give our tithes and offering this morning at Life Point Church. You are Alpha and Omega. You're the beginning and the end. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'll praise your name. I'll praise your name. You are Alpha and Omega. You're the beginning and the end. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'll praise your name. I'll praise your name. And Omega. You are Alpha and Omega. You're the beginning and the end. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'll praise your name. I'll praise your name. You are Alpha and Omega. You're the beginning and the end. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'll praise your name, I'll praise your name, hallelujah, holy, holy, Lord, you are worthy of my praise, hallelujah, holy, holy, Lord, you are worthy of my praise, we sing hallelujah, hallelujah.
Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. So, so this past Monday, right, we, we had a, a phenomenon occur, uh, which is the solar eclipse, right? Uh, you know, and, and people <laughs> all over the world, right, w- was pretty excited about the covering of, of the moon and, and the sun. And, and in the Midwest especially, I, uh, there were people that drove down to Indianapolis, right? And I believe they filled the, the Mortar Speedway Stadium to capacity. As a matter of fact, I was looking at Facebook on Monday or Sunday evening, and I, I'm part of the I-65 traffic report that's on Facebook, and there were, <laughs> there were pictures of back-to-back, right? If they say that traffic was terrible on I-65 just because... Uh, People wanted to see the moon uh, cover the, the sun and experience that four-minute uh, darkness and the drop of temperature. Right? And so here I am on Monday. I, I didn't go to Indianapolis. I, I didn't care enough to do that. Uh, but I, I was seeing the news, and I will listen to these broadcasters, these news broadcasters, and they will talk about you know, the experience, they, they would share how uh, that for them, it was a moment of greatness, right? To see how the universe, right, just works things out. But I, I was really glad to hear that one broadcaster said, you know, if anything, this should serve us humans as a reminder that there truly is a God. And so I'll admit that when, when it was kind of like the Midwest, like the Chicagoland area kind of experiencing that, that solar eclipse, um, I went outside and, and I was able to see, you know, 94% of our moon covering the sun. And, and I thought, wow, that's, that's pretty amazing. But again, the universe, the sun, the stars, the moon, the planets, um, It just didn't come out of nowhere. God created that. God did. And this this same God that created the universe, that created you and me, he cares about you. Think about it. We're... In comparison to the universe, we are speck. We're speck. And yet, God cares about you, cares about me. He loves us. And not only that, but he has given us his written word. Like, like God didn't just like walk away from us and ignored us. He didn't turn his back on us. He, he didn't say, you guys figure this out on your own. I got bigger things to deal with. God could have turned around and made this so different. And yet God said, no, I, I, I care about this small speck that we call the human race. I care about them so much. And then he's given us his word. He's given us his son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus himself said that. He gave his son to die for our sins. He, he raised Jesus from the dead. And then Jesus is coming back again. I mean, think about that. This same God that everybody was so marveled about. To see that, wow, the moon is covering the sun. And this is great. This, this is the God we serve. The one that created what we not know much about. There's so many things about the universe that we don't know. And yet God made himself known to you and me. And so with that said, I I want us to also come to this understanding. That I believe many times we may overlook or, or maybe we take for granted. And that is... 
that the same God that created you and me, our universe, he cares about your family. He cares about your marriage. He cares about your children. God cares about your present situation. He cares about your future situation. He cares about your tomorrow. God cares. And that is why that today we're going to begin a new sermon series titled Family Matters. Family Matters. And my focus for today's sermon is going to be part one of part two of what the Lord laid in my heart to title, and that is ideal and real. Ideal and real. The family. La familia. It is one of the very best And most essential things in our lives. And the Bible is clear that God created man and woman to unite them as one flesh. The Bible is clear that God blessed the union of Adam and Eve. And God called humanity to develop their relationship and to increase and multiply. In Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 27, it says this. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Later in the Bible, we see God instructing parents to train their children in the way of holiness and truth. Deuteronomy chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. Love the Lord your God and keep his requirements, his decrees, his laws, and his commandments always. He's over here talking to parents. He's talking to married couples that have children. He says, remember today. That your children were not the ones who saw and experienced the discipline of the Lord your God. His majesty, his mighty hand, his outreach arm, the signs he performs, and the things that he did. So let me just pause here for a second. This is God talking to the people of Israel that was just set free from the bondage of the Egyptians. And... God is telling the adults, he's telling the parents, he's saying, you got to teach your kids that you were once slaves in Egypt, but it was my mighty hand that took you out of Egypt. You have to teach your children that it was God that delivered you all. Then in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 19, God continues to say this to, to the parents, teach them to your children Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk alongside the road. When you lie down and when you get up, write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates so that your days and the days of your children may be many in the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors as many as the days that the heavens are above the earth. And if that wasn't enough, Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6 says this. Start children off on the way they should go. And even when they're old, they will not turn from it. The word of God also says this. I'm giving you a lot of Bible. Psalm 127, verse 3. Children are a heritage from the Lord offspring a reward from him in the new testament we see a strong statement that god gives to the apostle paul to write in first timothy chapter 5 verse 8 anyone who does not provide for their relatives 
and especially for their own household, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. I, I, I want you, I, I want that verse to, to settle deeply in, in your heart. Anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. As you can see, the family, la familia, it matters to God. It matters. And if it matters to God, it should matter to us. So, I want to provide you some statistics so that you can see where the state of the family is today. You guys ready for that? Because I don't, I don't want to. I don't want to escalate this. Give you all these Bible verses, and then not kind of bring you the reality of our situation. I think it's fair for me to do that. So here we go. There was a Pew Research that published an article on September 14 of 2023 titled "The Modern American Family." So here we go. Slide number one. It says this: The American family has undergone significant change in recent decades. There is no longer one predominant family form, and Americans are experiencing family life in increasingly diverse ways. In 1970, 67% of Americans aged 25 to 49 were living with their spouse and one or more children younger than 18. 67% in 1970. Moving to the next slide. Over the past five decades, that share has dropped to 37%. Married with kids in 1970, 67. Married with kids in 1990, 47%. Married with kids in, in 2020, 39%. And married with kids in 2021, 37%. Next slide. With the drop in the share of adults living with the spouse and children, there has been an increase in other types of family living arrangements, like unmarried adults raising children. So here we are, married with kids. We already read that. Cohabbing with kids. In the, in the 1990s, it was 2%. And then in 2010, it was four. And then here we are in 2021, we are at five. And then we see unpartnered with kids. Four, six, seven, six. Married with no kids, 18, 23, 21, 21. Cohabiting no kids, three, five, seven. Other family members, five, eight, 11, and 11. Okay. These are just quick overviews. As to the state of the family. And so the study basically found that Americans have a more negative view of the future of the family. Especially the future of the institution of marriage and family. And that is a concern. That's a concern. I don't know about you all, but it seems to me that the family structure has been in turmoil for a long time. Before I continue and before I go on, I, I want to make something very, very clear. In marriage, God made marriage to be between a man and a woman. And God expects that when a man and a woman comes together in holy matrimony, God expects them to remain faithful and God expects them to be pure to each other. And God expects for the family to flourish. 
Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4 says this. Marriage should be honored by all. I didn't make this stuff up. And the marriage bed kept pure. For God would judge the adulterer and all the sexual immoral. A husband and a wife should give 100% to their partner. And parents need to give their children the dignity and attention they deserve. Children are not doormats. They're not. I grew up in an era in the 90s as I was getting, you know, myself ready to get married and all that, where I used to hear a lot the concept of it must be 50-50. Marriage is 50-50, 50-50, and I, And I came to believe that. I thought, well, I, you know, hey, I get 50% of myself to Suhei. Suhei gives me 50% of herself to me, and there goes the 100. <laughs> I mean, that was my logic. But it took me a lot of years to figure out it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. As a matter of fact, I, I will tell you this, that I have found more joy in giving 100% of myself to my spouse than just 50. And, and, and I believe that, again, that's the intention that God has between a man and a woman. Because, where do I come to that understanding? Because Adam was left alone for a couple of hours when God created him. Adam was like lonely. He noticed that all these animals had companionship and there was nobody that looked like him. And God is like, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I look, again, I wasn't part of the creation account, <laughs> so I, don't, I can't read God's mind. And the Bible doesn't say this, but... And I might be stretching it a little bit, so for those that are deep theologians in the Bible, don't hang me, don't hang me on this, all right? But think about it. Why, why, why didn't God create Adam and Eve at the same time? Have you ever wondered that? Like, God already knew that Adam was going to feel lonely and out of place, so, so why not just get rid of that portion and just, like, create a, created the woman and, hey, voila, there you go, right? I mean, he did it with the animals. Why not the human? And, and I think this is why. It's because us men, sometimes we're hard-headed, and we think we could figure it all on our own. And then we realize, you know, we, we, can't, we can't do this on our own. Like, we need, we need a partner. We need our spouse. And so to avoid that, God turned around and says, Adam, I'm going to create you first because I want you to feel what loneliness is. I want you to feel what it is to really appreciate a partner. I want you to know how it really feels to really have a relationship with someone. So then when he felt like that, the Bible says that Adam went to sleep, God turned around, created a woman, and when Adam saw her, he said, how you doing, right? <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm talking about, right? He appreciated that. He appreciated that. And so look, here's the thing. Um, and we're going to talk about this more. Marriage is a beautiful thing. I mean, God put it together. I mean, I, I, he, he's the one that created it. It's good. But I, I know that, that marriage is hard. And I know that raising a family is hard. And I know that in family, there's a lot of complexities, man. There, there's just a lot. So, so the question becomes, look, okay, so why, why is there this negative tone towards marriage? Why, why is it there this negative or, or this heaviness or, uh, on marriage? What, what's going on here? Why, why are people today feeling this way? Look, I, I, I'm going to give you some possibilities, okay? Are you ready? I'm going to give you some possibilities. Number one. 
displacement of godly values. In America and as many parts of the world, the traditional families, the traditional values of, of marriage and family, which are based in the teachings of the Bible, they're, they're being challenged. And, and they're being challenged by the significant cultural changes happening in our society. Okay? Many, many people today, they, they, don't, they refuse to, to fight for the well-being of their families. And, and many are, are, are refusing to, to do what is right. They, they don't want to feel like they're being ostracized. And so what happens is they're, they're accepting some social norms that, according to Scripture, is not what God intended it to be. Look, if I may, I, I, I don't want to make this into a, a college class theological moment here, okay? But, but, but I... I in one of my, I, I went back to school, so I'm studying the book of Revelation. And so, anyway, my, my professor said something that was very interesting. My, my professor said that many times when we read the book of Revelation, and I'm not trying to deviate from today's topic, but uh, hear me out. He, he said something that was very powerful. He said, many times when people read the book of Revelation, the, the, the last book of the Bible, and we start reading about future events and things that will happen, as people today, we're, we're reading these things and we're so fascinated about, oh my goodness, the end times and how this is going to look like, that we many times overlook the condition of the church back then. Like, like we miss how the people of God were thinking back then and what we, they were going through back then. And the professor said something to me that, that I never knew or I overlooked. He said, the people, when John was writing the book of Revelation, the church was under tremendous persecution. And by that time, Emperor Nero, which was one of the worst, worst emperors the Rome ever had, he was killing Christians left and right. It was during that era that it's believed that the apostle John wrote these things. And Nero, Emperor Nero, wanted to claim himself to be God. Okay, And he wanted to turn the currency of the Roman Empire, he wanted to turn it into an idol and make it about himself as a god. So to bring it to us in this term, imagine if Washington, D.C. turns around and says, moving forward, George Washington, our first president, he is considered to be a god in the United States of America. Therefore, all of our currency is honored to the god of George Washington. What will that do for the church? Because I'll tell you this much, if you're telling me that my currency now belongs to the God of George Washington. According to the Bible, I only have one God. So guess what that means? Your 401k, your social security, all your money, you have to burn all that. Because if you keep it to yourself, that means that you're trusting the God of George Washington rather than the one true God that provides for all your needs. This is no different than when the Daniel's friends were told by Nebuchadnezzar to bow down and worship, and they said no. It is the same thing. So if that were to ever happen, which I pray to God that never does, if that were to happen, that means that your life and my life will forever be changed and we have to find another way to survive because the church of Jesus Christ cannot participate in idol worship for the Bible says there is one God and there is no other. So, so, so please, amen, give God praise for that, amen. That's what the Bible says. So, so think about it. The church back then, when John was writing this, they were under tremendous turmoil because that's what, C that's what the Roman Empire, Caesar, wanted to do. And today, although we're not having an issue with money, but we're having an issue with social norms. What once, once what, where in the past we used to call sin, now we're calling it okay. When the Bible says it's a sin... And when somebody is trying to destroy the institution of marriage and then the institution of family, 
It's not that we are hating on people that don't think like us. But what we say is that we do dislike what is being taught because the word of God teaches different. And so here's what's happening. When people begin to create these new social challenges and, and, and try to reconstruct the family, what they're doing is that they're displacing the values that God has put in his word for us to take and, and use it to bring glory to his name and also to betterment our lives. Okay, all right, I feel like I'm going on a tangent here, and I don't want to do that. Okay, what's the second thing? Sinful influence. Sinful in influence. When sin becomes more frequent, it will always undermine the fundamental principles of what a family should be according to God's word. Number three. Decay of moral foundations. I wish I had enough time to talk about this, but, but the moral compass, think about this, the moral compass of love, respect, and selflessness as provided by the word of God is essential for the well-being of a family. A family that fails to practice love, a family that fails to practice respect, a family that fails to respect being selflessness, that family that fails to practice these things, they will become dysfunctional. Number four, spiritual decline. Spiritual decline. Look, I, 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 wanna, I, I also want to make clear a reality that is happening in many households all over the world, here in America as well, right? We are part of the world. I understand that many of us are dealing with mental health issues. We're dealing with emotional health issues. We're dealing with physical health issues. But please understand there is a spiritual element in your life that needs also to be taken care of, and that is your spiritual health. Spiritual health plays a crucial role in maintaining your well-being as well as maintaining your family's well-being. A few years ago, I received a phone call in the middle of the night uh, from a man, a young man that I knew personally. And uh, he called me with a heavy heart. I mean, he was overwhelmed. He was crying. And he said to me, sorry that I'm calling you this late, but I just received a phone call from my girlfriend that just informed me that I was going to be a dad. And... Uh, he, that shocked him. Then in the conversation, he admitted to me and he said, look, I, I, I know nothing about being a father. Um, I, I, I know nothing about marriage. I, I just, I, I, I'm lost, he said. I'm just, I'm just lost. And, and I'm sorry that I'm calling you, but I... I know that the right thing to do is take responsibility for this child. I know the right thing to do is marrying my girlfriend. I know that's the right thing to do. I, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do it. I want my family to be religious like yours. That's what he said to me. I want my family to be religious like yours. And then the, the young man kept on going and saying, I, I didn't have a role model to look up to. I didn't have good upbringing. I, 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 I just don't know. And I kept on telling him, look, the, the reason my family is, 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 is healthy and strong and my marriage is, is because of Jesus. And I always take it to Jesus because it's really Jesus, right, that has kept my family and my marriage going. But, but here's one thing that I noticed. This young man, all his life, 
He was hungry to see and experience an ideal situation that he could apply to his life. Did you guys get that? Did you guys get that? All his life, whether he admitted it or not or recognized it or not, all his life, he was hungry to see and experience an ideal situation that he could apply in his life. Keep that in mind. When my wife and I bought our first house here in Hammond, we bought a little corner house and across uh, our, our kitchen window and our dining room rim window was the public school in, uh, of that community, the elementary school. And uh, every so often, every so often, we will see an elderly couple walk around the peri perimeters of the school. And uh, I will notice that this, this elderly couple, they will hold their hands nice and tight, and they will walk straight, and they won't even talk to each other. But they were just, you know, just holding hands. And they're just looking around. And they walked around the school several times. And one day I, 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 I noticed them again, and I said, that's, that's beautiful. Like, when I reach that age, I want me and Suhei to be just like that couple. Good looking like them, holding hands. They're not even saying a word, but you could tell that they enjoy each other's company. Later on, I discovered as I started coming to this church that this couple attended this church, that they were charter members of this church, and it was James and Pearl Bolkin, Jim and Pearl Bolkin. Jim went to be with the Lord a few years ago. Pearl is still living, and, and every so often we, we will connect with her. Um, but, you know, that, that made an impact in my life. I'm thinking, look at that. Like, that was beautiful. Like, I was like, yeah, I want to I do that. A few years back here at our church, we, we turned around and uh, honored Pastor Raymond and Sally's 70th year wedding anniversary. 70 years. How many of you got praise for that? And as many of you know, Pastor Raymond went to be with the Lord a few years back. And by that time that he went to be with God, they were married 72 years. Can I tell you that that moment, the privilege I had to, to just call them forward and we gave them a small gift of, I don't know, I know it was flowers, but, but 70 years. Like, like for me, I, I said, I want to do that. I want to be just like that. I want to live long enough that Suhei and I could, could have 70 plus years together. Like I strive for that. Like I look forward to that. Why am I bringing this to you? Because marriage, family, it's not something that's just about us. Marriage and family is about reflecting something greater, something beautiful that God wants us to share with others. You, you get where I'm going with this? Right? Like, like, like you'll be here trying to figure things out in, in your marriage, in your family, and I get it. We, we all are. But understand this. Someone out there is paying attention as to what's happening in your family. Someone out there is hungry to see how could my family look if I, what, right? And they're, and they're searching. And, they're, and you may think, you may think, oh, well, you know, they're not going to look at me. They're not going to pay attention to us. Yes, they, they are. Because today the dysfunction in family is so high, they have nothing to look up to. At least back in the 50s, they had Little Beaver, right? Or Beaver, what was the name of that show? Little Beaver or whatever, or, or you know. And what was it? 
Leave it to Beaver, okay? All right? But, but nowadays, TV shows, they don't, they don't even show that. I mean, a lot of TV shows, they show the man being stupid and the wife being super smart and whatever. I mean, I know it's comedy and I get all that. But, you know, and then it shows the kids running the house more than, than, than the parents. And, and you see all this, you know, stuff. And, and look, I, but, but, but that's not the ideal. I mean, that, that's, that's not what the Bible says. That's not what the Bible says. And look, I know that there is a sad reality that many families and many marriages are dealing or have dealt with devastating consequences of betrayal and infidelity. Okay. Having a unremorseful spouse or a unremorseful family member can destroy a once ideal home. I, I, I know that. It's, it's like the song that I heard in the 90s. It takes two to make a thing go right. And when one spouse chooses to go about it the wrong way, it, it it changes things. And it creates pain and hurt. But I, but I want you to also know that we serve a God who knows how to handle broken situations and bring restoration. Right? So I, I came across this statement, and I, and I want to share it with you. Um, it says this, don't let a broken, don't let brokenness or a failed situation count you out because you have a complicated past. You are capable of greatness as long as you follow Jesus to preserve your future. Th th think about this. The woman at the well that John speaks of, Jesus used her even though she was divorced five times. That's right. Jesus even, G go tell others, <laughs> I'm going to give you a word. And even though she had a lifestyle that was not in agreement to the word of God, God is compassionate. I, I want you to get this. Don't let the mistakes of the past rob you from what God wants to do now. God doesn't expect us and God doesn't want us to live in, in our sin. And if we repent from our wrongdoings, God will turn around and bring about restoration and use us in spite of the mess that we have caused or that someone caused for us, God could turn around, heal, restore, and bring about something great into your life. Don't let failures and setbacks rob you from God's best. Don't, don't let that. Don't let that. But also I want to emphasize the importance of an ideal to strive for is critical. Again, I'm a product of the 1990s, right? For basketball, everybody wanted to be like who in the 1990s? Who? Jordan, right? Jordan, Michael Jordan was the ideal basketball player everybody wanted to look up to and be. Your family and my family should be for the glory of God an ideal that people could look up to. And why do I stress that? Because just like the young man that called me in the middle of the night, there are many people, especially young people, Starting off families, wanting to get married, 
or just Mary and trying to figure this thing out, they're trying to get a clear picture of what a healthy and fulfilling family should look like. And parents and grandparents that are here today, I want you to know it is our responsibility to provide our children and grandchildren with something to strive for, for something for them to look forward to. If we as parents and family can't give it to our kids, then who else is going to give it to them? Who else is going to give it to them? Because somebody will. And it may be outside what the Bible teaches. And, and, and the responsibility of raising our kids is not the church, and it's not the public school system, and it's not a Christian school, and it's not an institution that is outside the family. The responsibility of raising our kids with moral values, biblical values, it is the parents. And if you don't do it, the devil will. Woo! I got some hard word for you today, but that is the truth. The devil will teach your kids, and the devil will draw them out the will of God. And you don't want that for your family. You don't want that for your generation. You don't want that in your family tree. You want that in spite of your brokenness, in spite of your challenges, in spite of whatever you've been through, in spite of the many mistakes you make. You want to be the one to teach your kids about what the Bible says in regards to the holiness of who God is and the institution of the family. Well, pastor, I don't feel adequate. Pastor, I've made a lot of mistakes. Pastor, I've been married a couple of times. Pastor, I've had bad choices. It doesn't matter if you repented from that. God will use you. God will restore you. God will make all things new. God will make you the person you need to be to love on your kids. Love on your kids. And teach them. There'll, there's going to come a point in time, parents, for those that are just having your kids now or your kids are kind of teenager or whatever, I want you to know that somewhere down the line, your kids are going to do whatever the heck they want. And they're going to come across like they're doing exactly what you're telling them to do. And next thing you know, they're doing the total opposite. So if you're waiting to train your kids like when they're teenagers, you're making a mistake. You train your kids now. You love on your kids now. And when they get older, they're going to go ahead and do their things, but you still love them. And you give them the respect and dignity that they deserve. And at the end of the day, look, guys, we parents, grandparents, we need to set the tone. And God called us to do that. God has given us the blueprint for what an ideal family should look like according to his word. God has given us a guide so that we could go ahead and look to. But also, also, I'm going to throw this at you because I'm going to talk about it next week. I am going to tell you this. Not only does God give us an idea, right, of how a, a, a healthy family should function, but God also tells us that to have a healthy family in the world that we live today is going to be super challenging because there's not one, there's not one family in the Bible, not one, not even Mary and Joseph because guess what they did? They left Jesus behind thinking that Jesus was with them when they went back home. So there's not one family in the Bible that we could read and say, I want to be just like them. Not one. Not one. Well, Pastor, hold on. It doesn't make sense to me. You're telling me that the Bible says that it gives you the idea of how a healthy family looks like. Yeah, the Apostle Paul does a great job. Parents love your children. Do not exasperate them, right? Men love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave his life for her. Women, submit to your husband. I mean, those, those are the ideas, right? That's, that's, that's the idea. But none of the families in the Bible were able to top that. Now, you're probably looking at me and thinking, then why in the world are you even teaching us this if, if it seems too far off to accomplish Because if we don't have anything to look up forward to, then we will be hopeless people. You, you, you get where I'm going with this? You get where I'm going with this? If we don't have anything to look up to, 
then we will, be, we will always feel defeated. That's why Jesus came. Because Jesus knows that we live in a broken world and that sin is going to do all that it can for us not to even desire to live the ideal principles of what a family and a marriage should look like. So let me just remind you again what 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 says. It says this, Christ died for our sins. Right? And because Christ died for our sins, God himself, through the person of the Holy Spirit, will help us in our weakness so that we could strive to live the ideal way of family and marriage according to the word of God. There is no perfection. You're never going to find a perfect family. And I believe that is why the Bible doesn't give us that because it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. My family is not perfect. Your family is not perfect. My marriage is not perfect. Your marriage is not perfect. If things are going to happen. I, I get it. I, I trust that I continue to stay married with my wife until I die. But I know that I live in a broken world. I get temptation. She gets tempted. We all get tempted. We all deal with issues. And I pray each day that none of us fall into temptation. But at the end of the day, Christ died for my sins so I could rely on the work of the cross and I could rely on the person of the Holy Spirit to give me wisdom and give me power and give me strength and give me, and give me everything that I need so that I could go ahead and honor God in my marriage, honor God in my parenting, honor God with my finances, honor God with my gifts and talents and ability. Why? Because the person of the Holy Spirit that lives in us will help us to strive to that. And I understand that today this topic of the family and this topic about, you know, marriage and, and all this stuff, it, 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 may, it may bring you memories of, 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 of past situations that you probably didn't even want to think about or, or even be concerned about. But I, I, I believe that it's important for me to talk about these things because the reality is all of us one day will be held accountable before God, before our action. And, and, and if we repent from our wrongdoings and we ask God to restore us, he will restore us. He'll make all things new and he will put in everything in perspective because God knows how to do that. If, if this doesn't make sense to you, I'm going to go ahead and close with this, okay? I promise you I'm going to close with this because the weather is great, and I'm sure some of you guys want to barbecue, maybe walk around the beach. I mean, that's kind of cool. But, but, but let, me, let me end with this. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 27. Listen to what Jesus said, okay? You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. Right. Where did Jesus get that from? The Ten Commandments, right? Don't commit adultery, okay? But listen to what Jesus says next. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Whoa, 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 whoa. Time out here, Jesus. Yeah, we heard this thing about adultery. Yeah, but now you're... You're taking this further up. Like, whoa, why, why are you doing that? Like, that's impossible to do. Like, like to do that, it's good. What, you're telling me it's the same? And Jesus said, yep, it is. You know why Jesus did that? <laughs> Jesus did that because he wanted to raise the bar. He wanted to raise the bar because when you raise the bar, then you have something greater to look up to. And you say, that's something that I know I can't do. So I need God to help me not to lust. You get, you get where I'm going with? So if you love your family and you love your marriage and you got all drama and you got all these challenges and you got all these difficulties and you got all these disagreements and you got all that, I'm sure you come to the point you say, okay, this is, this is too big. Like, I, I can't, I, I, I can't, I can't. And, and then this is where God says, I can. So look up to me. Because this, this right here, this is the ideal. A young man met with me yesterday. He said to me, Pastor, my future looks bleak. <laughs> I'm scared about my future. 
say, why are you scared? Because I made a lot of bad decisions. I said, okay. Have you learned from it? Yeah. Have you repented from it? Yes. Are you going to do the right thing? Yes. Then I said, be a man. Be a man. Stand strong. Stand firm on the promises of God. And don't let your past mistakes dictate what God has in store for you. Because if we stay in the past, we're missing out on what God wants to do next. So, hey, if this sermon spoke to you today, right, if this sermon encouraged you, or even if it didn't, I expect you to be here next Sunday for part two. (laughs) And I expect you to come back and listen to the second portion of real. I'm talking about ideal. Well, what's the real? What's the reality? How does this look like? Let us pray. Father, we thank you for today. And, uh, and Lord, you, you, you love the family. You love every family that's represented here. You love every family that's viewing us online. You love every individual today, Father. And I know that among this crowd and those that are viewing, Father, there are people that are contemplating marriage. There are people, Lord, that are struggling in their marriage. There are people today, Father, that are scared of marriages. There are people today that are overwhelmed by the marriage. And and so, God, again, this is a reality. This is a truth that we all as people struggle with because we live in a world that is hard. It's complicated. But I thank you, God, that you're not complicated. You're not complicated. You're faithful. You're true. You're all-knowing. And I pray, God, that you would help each of us understand the great love you have for us, that you have for our families. And I pray, God, that you will help us to appreciate the teachings of your word because it's, it's for our own good. It's, it's for our spiritual health. It is for our strengthening of faith. You're, you're not here to call people down. You're not here to condemn folks. You, you made that very clear. You said, I didn't come to condemn the world, but that the world will be saved to, through you because already the world's already been condemned because of sin. So why are you going to add to that? There, there's no reason for that. So that's why you came to save us. And so, Lord, help us. Help us leave here, Father, with with appreciation of what you have done and what you continue to do. Forgive us, O Lord, for our shortcomings. Forgive us of things that we've done and said, Father, that that has been wrong, that has been sinful. Forgive us, O Lord. We strive, we desire to honor you, Lord, to honor you with our children, to honor you with our spouses, to honor you with our family. We want our legacy, Father. We want our family tree, Lord, to to be people that will seek after you and that will trust you above all else. No matter what comes our way, we want to have a family that will believe in you wholeheartedly because, God, you will never fail and you will never disappoint. And so, Holy Spirit, Thank you for speaking into our hearts. You know the condition of each and every one of us. Help us to surrender more of ourselves to you, Lord. Can you please stand with me? Today, if you want to be prayed for, or if you simply just want to come forward, to pray at the altar. You are more than welcome to do that today. You know me well enough as your pastor that I never want to end a Sunday service without giving you an opportunity to respond to what the Spirit of God has laid in your heart today. We believe in the power of prayer. And if you want to be prayed for for any situation in your life, come. We have elders and deacons today that are going to pray for you. We're going to go ahead and sing a song. But let the Spirit of God continue to speak into your heart. We're about to leave shortly, but let's give this moment to God. Can we do that? Can we do that? The altar is open. Come and let us believe God's best for you today. I 
I speak the name of Jesus over you. In your hurting, in your sorrow, I will ask my God to move. I speak the name because it's all that I can do. In desperation, I'll seek heaven and pray this for you. I pray for your healing, that circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside would flee in Jesus' name. I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray miracles over your life in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. I speak the name of all authority, declaring blessings, every promise he is faithful to keep. I speak the name no grave could ever hold. He is greater, he is stronger, he's the God of possible. I pray for your healing, that circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside would flee in Jesus' name. I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray miracles over your life in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Oh, come believe it, come receive it. In the power of His Spirit is now forever yours. Come believe it, come receive it. In the mighty name of Jesus, all things are possible. I pray for your healing. That circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside would flee in Jesus' name. I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray miracles over your life in Jesus' name. I pray for revival. The desperation of faith. I pray that the dead will come alive in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. You are at work, Lord, and we stand on your promises. Let me bless you today. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. God bless you all. Don't forget this Wednesday we have a great Bible study. As a matter of fact, I have a special guest. Pastor Spencer Jones will be joining us Wednesday night here at 630. God bless you all. Thank you, everyone.
Tak, 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 tak,